Hello, everyone. I am Chris Hyam, CEO of Indeed, and welcome to the next episode of Here to Help. At Indeed, our mission is to help people get jobs. This is what gets us out of bed in the morning and what keeps me up at night. What powers that mission is our people. Here to Help is a look at how the experience, strength, and hope inspires people to want to help others. Today is the final day of February, and all this month we have been celebrating Black History Month in the U.S. and Canada. Black History Month is an annual celebration to honor the contributions and sacrifices of Black Americans who have shaped our nation and history. My guest today is Dr. Shayla White Ramsey, a Senior Training and Development Manager here at Indeed. Shayla is a first-generation college graduate. She earned her bachelor's degree from Louisiana State University and a master's degree from the University of West Florida. From there, she was awarded the prestigious Huell D. Perkins Fellowship and received her PhD in Human Resources Leadership from Louisiana State University. Shayla has been helping people get jobs since even before she joined Indeed, which you'll be hearing more about shortly. She has committed her life to helping people to do the best work of their lives. Shayla, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you, Chris, for having me. Well, let's start where we always start these conversations. How are you doing today, right now? Today, right now, I'm okay. Uh, I am in the process of relocating from Austin back to Louisiana. You mentioned that, got my doctorate and my bachelor's there. That is where I'm from. So I'm in the process of moving. So it's an exciting time, but also a transition. Fantastic. Well, we're uh, excited that you'll be going back to be close to family, but we'll sorry. Sorry to lose you here in Austin. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about your job. You are a senior training and development manager here in Indeed. Can you explain uh, your role and how you help people get jobs? Sure. So at Indeed, we have a fantastic group of people. They are called Indeed Recruitment Evangelists. And their job is to scale our brand as a thought leader and as a partner to our enterprise clients. My job is to enable them to do their job through training and development. So I facilitate and lead training. Um, I bring in external trainers to make sure they have what they need. Um, I design and launch different learning and development initiatives and generally foster a sense of learning among the group. It's, it's wonderful. I love it. Um, and I love the evangelists. It's such a cool job. You have a really interesting career journey, which I've now had the, the pleasure of uh, hearing detailed a couple of times. Um, and you have a PhD in human resources development. Can you talk about your interest in people and where that developed? Sure. So I would say that that's probably started just a general interest in people. Probably during my undergrad, I made the choice to major in psychology. So I had a choice. I, I was choosing between psych or marketing because I generally was interested in the way that we think and behave and the way that we make decisions. Now, I made the conscious choice to not do clinical counseling psychology um, because I know myself. I know that I have a tendency to get very connected emotionally to um, the work. And I knew that about myself even back then. So instead of doing clinical counseling psychology, I decided to study uh, the psychology of people at work, which is industrial organizational psychology. So that was uh, the choice I made. And it just came from a general curiosity about why we act the way we act <laughs> and what that shows up like in the workplace. So you grew up in Louisiana and um, what, part of the experience of being in Louisiana is uh, it has been the nexus of a uh, significant impact of economic shocks, uh, industry closures, and then of course, Hurricane Katrina. Can you talk about some of those experiences and how that shaped you? Sure, so Hurricane I want to start with Hurricane Katrina because I think that that was um, that was kind of like the first domino in a series of of a lot of choices that ended up shaping and leading me to where I am right now. So I'm from coastal Louisiana. Um, hurricanes were always a, a constant threat. It's what I lived with. We learned how to track hurricanes when I was in the second grade, um, how to track them on a longitude, latitude on a map. So this is something that was very much embedded in the way we lived there. And because it's coastal, 
a lot of the men in that region worked in the offshore oil industry, including my father. So Katrina comes, um, devastates the region. At the time, my parents are living in coastal Mississippi and we lose our home there. Um, just everything like it, it was like completely destroyed. Um, and my father was laid off from his job just because of everything that was happening. This was just an extra blow to the situation. Um, and it was taking him much longer to find a job than he had anticipated because his work was in the offshore industry. And if we know anything about that industry, we know how fickle it is. It's up and down, um, all, very volatile. So after maybe two years of a, of a quite debilitating job search, I decided to try to help him by drafting a resume for him and trying to help him job search uh, using this new landscape. So I went to my university's career center. I learned, I let them help me with my resume. I learned how to do a resume. And then I took what I learned and brought that back to him to do his resume and help him um, with interviewing and job searching. At the time we were using the local newspaper, but Indeed was brand, brand new. And I learned about how to use that in my career center. So I was showing him that. Um, and eventually we found him a new gig. But then something else happened. He started to send all of the other people who had worked offshore, all these other men who had worked in this industry over to me so that I could do their resumes to help them get jobs. And I got to tell you, it was very, it was fascinating because the work, I knew nothing about the work from a technical standpoint. I didn't know what a deckhand was, a pipe fitter, a ship fitter. I didn't, a journeyman, all these different <laughs> jobs that I had never heard of. But I started to write resumes for these men who had never had to write a resume before in their life. And I started to, I mean, I charged them because this was my business. So I charged them $5 per resume. And uh, this was a little extra money for me and a little extra help for them. And it, it changed me uh, significantly. And I hope made a positive impact on, on those of the few of them who were, who were able to bounce back and, and find a new role. So you said it changed you. Can you talk a little bit about what, what you learned from that experience of seeing uh, these men, many of whom I would imagine because of the industry they were in, probably never even had to have a resume before and how you construct that and then what it was like for them to to try to use that to search for jobs and and how did that how did that shape your view of getting a job I think that I mean for starters you know a lot of the people in this group offshore work is really hard work it is not um, unskilled labor. It is very challenging work. But I think that um, my job at the time was to help them find a way to portray that on paper, that they were highly skilled, that they were whole people who could communicate um, and, and, and they were competent and proficient and excelled in their work. And I found that that was kind of challenging to do through a resume. So that was my first uh, learning was that resumes are, are challenging to, to try to get the whole picture across. Um, but I, I did some research and I, I learned some tricks about how to structure the resume, how to format it, um, because I know that you know bias is a thing. I, I learned about name bias and, and all of these different things in an effort to help them. So that was the light bulb for me. Um, and then when it came to just how it impacted me personally, you know, I was coming out of college. I was having trouble finding a job myself. <laughs> um, and so I was writing resumes and helping all these people, but also having trouble on my own, you know, trying to find a job. And I found that it was kind of soothing to be able to help someone else. Uh, despite the fact that I was also struggling in the same area, it gave me just a little bit of comfort. Um, and that was that was just major to me in that moment, because, you know, the job search can be debilitating. It can be mentally draining. We all know this. And then finally, when it comes to just barriers to employment. So a lot of the population who I was working with, they did not. Well, not a lot of them. I'll say like a, a percentage of them. They had been. um we call it justice impacted. 
today, but back then we called it, they had a record. Um, and that to try to convey that they are still whole people and that they can still do the work. You know, the offshore industry at that time was one of the few industries that was fair chance. They were bringing people in. And so when it shut down, it just became even harder. And so it was just a, a number of barriers that we were trying to navigate. And I realized that we were individuals trying to navigate a system that was just full of barriers and full of bias. And I was trying to do it in the most minuscule way, <laughs> which was to write them the most beautiful resume that I could, to format it in a way that seemed brilliant and to make them stand out on paper as much as I could. Um, learned a lot about systems, learned a lot about system theory. I didn't even know that's what I was learning at the time, but I learned that if you put a good person against a bad system, the system wins, you know, and and that was kind of, it was a little bit sad, but it was all also like quite empowering to know that here's what we can do on an individual level, but it only goes so far. Pretty early on, you had already dedicated yourself to helping other people in, in their journey to find employment. Um, and then in the meantime, you're getting ready to graduate in 2008, which was a, an interesting time uh, to be going out into the job market. Can you talk a little bit about that time and, and what was going on for you and how that impacted you? Sure. Um, so the 2008 recession, I'm coming out of college, quite proud of myself for having finished. I've you mentioned earlier, I am a first generation college graduate, so I was ready. You know, I had been taught like many of us, you go to school, you get your education, you'll find a good job and life will be less hard. Uh, and I came out of school and I started to put myself out there and I realized that my career prospects were uh, were nil. I, I, I couldn't find anything. I had gone on I mean, it's hard to remember the exact number, but it was like like a dozen interviews in the course of just like maybe four or five months. So many interviews. Um, and I got really good at interviewing. <laughs> I got really good at job searching, but nothing, no one was biting. People did not want to hire me. I didn't have the experience and it was a recession. So economically, the country was strapped. It was a hard time. Um, you know, at the time I made the choice to ride it out in grad school. So I decided to go ahead and go get my master's, uh, take on a little bit more debt and try to improve my chances of getting of getting a job. But not everybody had that option. And we were seeing it all around us, people losing jobs, of course, but also losing things like homes. People were losing their house. Um, I started to see it and I made the choice in that moment that even if I get a job, even if I get a full-time job, I'm gonna hone some sort of skill so that I can utilize that to make money if I needed to. Um, I made the choice to not solely rely on a full-time job because for my income because uh, people were losing them left and right. And I do believe that with our generation, um, this concept of the side hustle I think it's a direct result of that 2008 recession, because I think a lot of people were seeing that a lot of people were seeing, you know, their families destabilized by the economy and realizing that we have to learn a skill or a trade that someone would give us money for <laughs> in addition to our full time work. Um, and so that's uh, I think that directly impacted me today. And then, you know, the resume writing stayed on as my side hustle, just moving forward. Um, I kept that with me and I kept that in my back pocket because I think it created a fear, a scarcity mindset um, going through that and trying to find a job and not being able to and seeing so many people lose theirs. But grad school was the answer for me and it ended up working out in my favor. Um, I'm very fortunate because of that. So I'd love to actually talk a little bit about some of the the academic perspective on this. So the primary theme of this uh, podcast of these conversations that we have is really around what um, inspires people to want to help others. But in, in in our case, I mean, it's just because of what we do as a business. But um, can you talk a little bit about from from your studies 
what it is that, that you've seen that makes people want to do what it is that they do? I, I can talk about it in two ways. So the first way to just get this out there, um, we trade a certain amount of labor for a certain amount of money, and it's very transactional, and we do it because we have to, right? So there's a part of us that, you know, we work because we have to. Then there's also a part of us, um, we work because it gives us a sense of purpose. And I think that that becomes more and more important the more you're able to do work that's in line with your values. So if you're able to do work that's in line with what you feel is important, that allows you to demonstrate your strengths, then it becomes more than just a transactional um, situation. It becomes transformational and it becomes an outlet for you to work in your purpose. And then something that's that we've also, um, we've some of us have been missing, especially since 2020 and um, the pandemic, is work as a, um, a social outlet or as a place for us to build connections and relationships with people. When we have this at work, when we have this option, it makes work more rewarding and enriching. And it's another reason why we do it. And when you take that away altogether, it can make work quite stressful over the long haul. And if you take away the ability to work in line with your values and have that values alignment, it could also make work quite stressful. And what happens with that prolonged stress is that we eventually get to a place of burnout if, if we continue to go without meeting those needs. So there's work as transactional for financial gain. I think there's work as a sense of purpose and, and values alignment and work as a social connection a place for us to connect with other people and build relationships. And I think if we take away any of those for a long period of time, work starts to get uh, much more challenging and we start to experience lots of stress. So one of the things, um, you know, you had this experience early on looking at the impact of um, the 2000, 2008 economic crisis and and then obviously the last couple of years with with the pandemic and and one of the things that um, upheavals like that do is is they certainly change our perspective or our relationship. But the other thing that happens is they um, they can expose underlying symptoms that are already there that might not be as visible or obvious to 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 everyone. But some of these inequities, you know, were just laid bare by the uh, the pandemic. Can you talk um, a bit about how you've seen our relationship with work change as a result of of crises like this? Yeah, I it so it depends. There's a couple of different things, and I, I'm trying to decide which way I want to go with this. But um, I, I saw a quote probably like midway through. Um, 2020. And it said something like, we're all experiencing the same storm, but we're not all in the same boat. Like some of us are in a canoe, some of us are on a yacht, some of us are in a dinghy, you know, like, and I, I think that that's true. And I think that when COVID first came on board and this idea of essential workers having to go in and, and go to work, and we're calling these people essential, but when it comes to our social reward and who was being um, rewarded, the essential workers were not. They were being put under the most stressful work conditions. They were exposing themselves to possibly getting sick. Many people died um, and they weren't compensated in a way that suggested that these people are essential. And when I'm saying this, I'm, I'm talking about people who worked in grocery stores, people who were frontline workers. Um, meanwhile, people at a higher socioeconomic status who maybe worked in corporate or in tech, um, many of us, we worked from home. You know, we had companies that said, hey, you know, we're going to make sure that you're protected. You're going to work from home. And I think that just that in and of itself, that showed something. <laughs> something was wrong. Um, and I think that that definitely impacted later what became known as this idea of the great resignation or people leaving work because it started to show that, you know, at the end of the day, you have to take care of yourself by any means necessary, whatever that looks like. Nobody's going to tell you to stop. Nobody's going to tell you 
Maybe it's time to take a break. Um, you have to know that for yourself. And so as people started to change their relationship with work, we start to see people leaving the workforce and opting out in droves. And we also started to see this concept of rest and play as being revolutionary, right? <laughs> like it's almost like it's almost like pushing back against a systemic, a system that's designed to create burnout by resting and playing and changing your relationship with work so that it's no longer your sole identity, but so that now it is a place for you to do some values, do some purpose-driven work. It's a place for you to get paid, but it does not have to become you. Um, we can create a better boundary there. And I think that's what people started to do. Yeah. And I, I know that this is an area that you've been really focused on of, of resiliency and how to avoid uh, burnout. And this is something, again, kind of like I was saying before, it has always been an issue. But in the last couple of years, one of the things that's happened with the pandemic is it's just been so clear the extraordinary pressure that everyone is un under both at work and in the rest of their life. So it's not even like you come to a stressful job and then you go home and then everything is relaxed because people have been worried about their economic security, their health and safety, their families and their communities. And so um, what are some of the things that you know you think we can be doing to help avoid burnout? I want to start by saying that burnout is a systemic problem. So there are things we can do as individuals in the meantime to cope and navigate and live within that system. But ultimately, the way things are set up, it's kind of hard to avoid it. So that's that's the first thing. But I will say on a macro level, just thinking about some of the things that Indeed is doing, like our flexible work arrangements, the option to take you know, a little time off or even to drop down uh, your workload, I think that those things can be helpful. One of the things that I shared with you, Chris, a while back was this feeling of um, a couple of years ago, how I was feeling just chronic burnout, just debilitating. And I made the choice to go down using our flexible work arrangement, that 80% schedule, because at the time I felt like my burnout was due to just, I needed more rest. Right. I'm just tired. I just need more rest. And this is why I'm experiencing burnout. But I think looking back on it, I can see that while rest was a small factor, I wasn't I was experiencing burnout because I wasn't getting the social connection and reward uh, that I mentioned earlier that comes with work. I was lonely. You know, I was isolated. I felt by myself and it really it started to to take its toll on me. And so I did a little bit of research about why we are experiencing burnout. Uh, so this goes back to my, I'm a doer. I went back to what I knew. And because I was struggling in the summer of 2020, I did a very small qualitative research. And it sounds crazy because it's like, why are you doing more work if you're burnt out? <laughs> but I was so tired of feeling that way. And I wanted to know how other black women who were similar to me we're experiencing this. You know, what was, were they experiencing this burnout? What was driving it? Um, so I did a survey. I asked 200 Black women, like, are you experiencing burnout? What do you think the cause is? And I read all the responses and people were saying what I was saying. I don't feel connected. I feel lonely. I feel isolated. Um, this work is not important to me. <laughs> you know, I'm doing work that is not in line with my values, essentially. Um, I don't feel a sense of control. I feel like life is happening to me and I can't control anything. Or I'm tired. I'm overworked. The work is very rote. It's very routine or it's too much. It's too complex. So I started to realize there, there were all these drivers of burnout. And depending on your driver, individually, you can do some things to help alleviate it. So when I realized what my driver was, this feeling of loneliness, and I'm sure many of the people on my team can attest to this, because I started <laughs> reaching out to them, putting all these coffee chats on their calendars. Many of them, <laughs> like, I'm just like, can I get 30 minutes with you? I just want to see how you're doing. Um, I just want to talk. I just want to connect with you. Um, and this was before the, the dreaded Zoom fatigue set in. So I, I probably wouldn't do that today. <laughs> But at the time, I just felt 
disconnected. And so I started to try to connect myself as much as possible. And that was when I started realizing that community as an antidote to burnout um, could be quite powerful. Getting people together to validate one another's experiences, getting people together to talk about it and, and just be there for one another. It can be, a again, just a, a balm for, for what can be just a really painful or, or isolating situation. So I started to lean heavily on community. I started to create those communities. And eventually things got much better. And I, I still, I mean, I still marvel at how it was able to get better because I was quite pessimistic um, and cynical. <laughs> I didn't even believe that burnout recovery is possible. And I'm gonna be honest with you, I still go back and forth <laughs> about like whether or not everyone can recover, but I will say that it helps to build that community of people um, and to have those conversations with others about, about what you're experiencing. So from a community perspective, one of the things that you did was um, what you uh, we were talking about last week, this sister circle. Can you talk a little bit about what, what that was and, and what it meant for you and the other women involved? Yeah, so when I did that qualitative, uh, it was a survey and a couple of interviews, some interviews with folks, I asked about a few things. So I was experiencing burnout, so I asked about that. I was experiencing imposter syndrome, which now I wonder, or you know, lately I wonder if that might have been a side effect of the burnout, because once upon a time, I used to feel quite competent and skilled in my work. And I swear, burnout just obliterated my confidence. And so I was experiencing that and I wanted to see if other people were experiencing that. Um, and there were a couple of other mindsets that I was hoping to shift, including perfectionism and people pleasing, because these two things I found were really, um, really kind of holding me back in my career and my, my desire for advancement. So I did, I created something called the sister circle for high achieving black women so I invited a few people who took the survey. I asked them if they would want to be invited to something where we get together and talk about it. So I invited them, about eight people. And over the course of six weeks for that very first one, we talked about these different topics. Each week we focused on something different. We talked about burnout. We talked about people pleasing and the mindset and maybe where that comes from, particularly as Black women, where that comes from in our community. We talked about perfectionism and this idea of you have to be twice as good to get half as much and how that drives perfectionism and whether or not that serves us. Um, we gave each other room to question those stories that in our community, you know, they're handed down like <laughs> inheritance, you know, this idea of being twice as good to get half as much. We gave ourselves permission to question that. Um, talked about, like I mentioned, burnout. And we talked about that imposter syndrome that comes along after you might have experienced something or maybe after you're um, awarded a certain, a certain recognition or whatever the case may be. So we talked about all those things. We talked about what's called the behavior chain, which is not something I created, but I use that as a model for the conversations. And the way it works is um, we see and hear something. So we experience something. We tell ourselves a story about what we just saw and heard. Based on that story, we feel some kind of way. And then based on that feeling, we act. And we use that to dissect our feelings of perfectionism, of people pleasing, of even procrastination. That was another one that we talked about because all of that manifests based on the stories that we tell ourselves and the way we feel and how it drives our behavior. And you might not be able to change the way you feel because by the time you start to feel something, you feel it, it's just, is there, right? And then you act, but you can change your story. And so based on what we saw and heard, what was the story that we were telling ourselves and was there room to change it? So that one story I just used as an example, like you have to be twice as good to get half as much if you are a woman, a person of color in the LGBT community, can I change that story? Is it true? right? Like, where did that come from? What if we changed that? And we said that I'm here because I'm qualified to be here. How does that change the way we feel? And then how does that change the way we act? So 
Each week in a sister circle, we did that. We challenged our stories and assumptions. We validated one another. And it was so, so good. Uh, and the people who walked away from that first group, they were like, you got to do this again. <laughs> you know? Like you got to do this more. We need more of this. So I started running it and I did another one um, with a whole new group of, of eight black women. And they came from everywhere and we got together and we had our coffee one hour a week for six weeks. And we we did that. And it's just that space, that community for alleviating some of those challenges that I personally was feeling. So selfishly, it, it was um, what my graduate professor would have called vanity research <laughs> because I was feeling it. But um, I also think I would like to believe that it also helped other people as well. That's, that's an amazing story. Um, thank you for sharing that. Um, you know, one of the things when we were talking last week that that came up that um, we had a, a, a connection was around uh, ceramics and, and pottery. And I know that that's something that is uh, important to you. Can you share a little bit about the, the role that that plays in your life? The caveat is I am not um, a great ceramicist. So I'm going <laughs> to share that now. But yes, yeah, so I started last year, early last year, I started learning how to throw pots on the potter's wheel because um, it's just an opportunity that came up. I, I'm always fascinated with watching other people do it. And so I took a class and I loved it. I thought it was so uh, calming and meditative, the idea of sitting at the potter's wheel and you get a block of clay um, and it starts from nothing and being able to create something from that. There's just so much power in creating. And I firmly believe that we're on this earth to make in whatever way that that might be. Um, so it was it was powerful to be able to do that. But then I got really um, comforted by the impermanence of clay because it's changing and you can mold it and shape it. But that also means that there's some impermanence there. Every stage of the process from centering your clay to pulling it up into a vessel to taking it off the wheel and trimming it to firing it. Every step of that process is fragile. Something could happen. It could all fall apart, right? If you center the clay and, or if you don't do it the right way, when you try to bring it up, it's going to fall apart, right? If you take it off the wheel, um, even if you don't do that the right way, it can fall apart. It can blow up, explode in the kiln. There's so much that can happen. And I took comfort in that. Um, as a self-proclaimed control, I don't even like the word control freak because I don't, I don't like that. I feel like that's a little dehumanizing, but I, I have a thing about control. I like to be in control. And when it comes to pottery, you, you have to let that go. You have to be willing to let things fall apart. You have to be willing to let it take shape. And there's some times when it turns into just something beautiful. And then there are some times where it turns into something beautiful and it falls apart. And then there's some times where it just doesn't. Um, but in any case, what you envision usually is never the way it ends up. It usually ends up way, way better or it doesn't end up at all, <laughs> which is, which I think is uh, meditative. I have, can I show you? I have a, oh, yeah, <laughs> please. So this is my favorite. It's really hard to see, but this is my favorite piece that I've, that I've made. But then I put it in the kiln and you see the kiln gods took their due because you see it's broken. So said all that to say, um, it's still comforting. It's still my favorite piece um, because I think it's beautiful. I think the colors came out, but I did not plan for it to come out this way. Um, and, it, and it rarely ever does. And I think that's a metaphor for life, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and we spoke about it. So I um have not done ceramics in in over 30 years. I, I had the uh, amazing opportunity my senior year of college to take a year long class with uh, an extraordinary teacher um, who, who passed away a few years back, um, Japanese Hawaiian woman named Toshiko Takaezu. Um, and she taught this introductory course where I was, which was um, pretty extraordinary. And it was for me coming on the heels of, um, I had a I had a really difficult time my first few years of college and had had worked basically over the summer to get my life together. And, and so part of it was um, I was looking actually to just 
give myself a little bit of a break. So I decided to sign up for something that I thought was going to be easy in this class. And it turned out that it was actually extraordinarily challenging. And it was it was sort of where so much of my, um, you know, healing <laughs> kind of came from from that experience and and everything that you described, you know, and in particular, we talked about this before, the experience of centering itself, which is this extremely meditative, very difficult for me at first process of just trying to get this crazy lump of of clay to actually just get on the right spot. And but there's something incredibly amazing. Once you figure it out, you you literally get a center of gravity from it. And and that that concept of centering, I mean, they call it centering the clay, but it's a very centering and meditative kind of experience. And, um, you know, what, what you described also about essentially letting go of the results. And I think for for anyone that has any kind of streak of perfectionism, it's actually really uh, helpful to do things where you have no control. Because I know that that my tendency sometimes is as someone who really wants to do things as well as they can be done, the degenerate form of that is to just limit all of the things in your life that you can't properly predict how they're going to work out. And, and people's lives can get very small that way. And so for me, it's actually been really help, helpful throughout my life to do things that I have very little. I'm, uh, I, I bake bread. That's one of the things that, that I do. And I, I've, I'm one of those Are people doing uh, I well, I've been doing it for over thirty years, and then at the at the start of the pandemic, I started. Um, I had always been afraid of sourdough, and like a million other people, started baking sourdough bread, and uh, and it's 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 amazing um, because you have so because you do so much, and there's so many steps, and then you put the thing in the oven, and it and it either you know rises beautifully and has this incredible ear, or it just falls flat, and it's a total catastrophe. Um, and it's amazing to, to sort of leave that, that control aside. And, and like you said, the extraordinary thing is, is not that, well, yeah, it may blow up and, and be terrible, but that it also, for me, the really powerful lesson is that the things that I'm not in control of turn out to be the most beautiful and surprising and extraordinary and letting things happen. Um, so anyway, I, for anyone that hasn't had the chance to try it, if you, uh, if you can have access to a ceramics class, there's something really magical that happens there. There's power. There's power in it. I love it. So one of the things that you have clearly, and we've been talking about this, you've dedicated your life to helping other people achieve their career aspirations. And and I think you maybe have answered this, but but maybe just to sort of tie it all together here as we're wrapping up, what why does that mean so much to you to help other people with their career aspirations? I wish that I could say that it was wholly noble. <laughs> I just want to help people <laughs> and I do want to help people. Um, but it does something for me. I think that it offers me a reward. It offers me a sense of purpose. It's immediate. Uh, when I was in academia, the thing that I struggled with the most was how long everything took. <laughs> like everything took forever. <laughs> you do the research and then you get published. By the time you get published, the research is outdated. It's just the impact was so far down the line. And I feel like when I am facilitating a training or having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with someone about their work or, or writing a resume or helping someone learn something, I can see the aha moment. I can literally see it in people's faces. I facilitated so many, um, particularly in person, it's a little bit easier, but I facilitated so many uh, learning experiences and I can see when people get it and that does something to me. That's like a, a little ding uh, every time. And so working in a field where I'm able to constantly do that and know that I'm making a difference and know I can see my impact it's just, that's for me. That's the field for me. That's why um, that's why helping pe people with their career aspirations and their professional development aspirations became just quite rewarding. I love that. And I wish, you know, it, every, anybody who wanted it, anybody who wanted a, a career like that, where they could see that thing, I wish that for all of us. Um, and then the other part of that is specifically when it comes to 
communities that have been historically excluded. Economic empowerment is a game changer. It is so important that equity and trying to foster that and close those gaps, closing the wealth gap, closing the employment gap for people who have been historically excluded or marginalized, that's important to me. And it's one of the reasons why I work hard on myself to get into positions where I can help people, where I can make decisions that would help close some of those gaps and bring some economic empowerment to other groups. I career coached with people back in the day when I, when I did a lot of one-on-one -on -one career coaching, I worked with people who would not normally have access to something like a career coach. So I'm working, I'm talking to people about their values and, and stuff at work. And they're like, look, I just need a job. Like, I'm not trying. But the reason for that is to offer some sort of exposure because I have this beautiful tie to these two worlds and I can kind of be a bridge there. Well, we always close with the same question. And um, I... Uh... I would love to hear your thoughts on looking back over the last two years since the start of the pandemic. And we really are right at the two year mark now for indeed, it was March 3rd of 2020 when we made the decision to send all of our employees to go work from home. And um, what in that experience with all of the challenges that we've seen has given you some uh, bit of optimism for the future? I think that my hope lies in people taking their power back. Um, this way that people are um, finding a new relationship with the concept of work. My hope is seeing people who set boundaries and who rest um, and, and who find ways to make their lives enjoyable because we learned that the things that we thought mattered the most, um, they don't matter. <laughs> and so like my hope is, is seeing other people find that for themselves. I just, I hope that we can sustain that um, over time, just as things continue to evolve, because I won't even say go back to normal, but as things evolve, I hope we can sustain this rest and play as a revolutionary act. I, I really want us to keep that. Well, Shayla, thank you so much for joining me. I, I can't tell you how much I've enjoyed this conversation and um, had the opportunity to, to actually spend quite a bit of time with you and, and talk with you. But it's really amazing just to be able to hear this all uh, in one place and to get to share this with other folks. You um, are an inspiration. And um, yeah, thank you for joining me. And thank you for everything that you do to help people get jobs, both in your job and you know, on your personal passion time and, and you've dedicated so much of your life to this. So um, thank you so much for all of that. Thank you, Chris. 